romanticism, that interesting literary movement of the early 18th century that emphasized nature, individuality and the importance of passion and feeling. Well known for writers such as George Byron, Mary Shelley, Victor Hugo and many more. But today we will discuss a lesser known romantic, one of the last actually, Mihai Eminescu. Mostly unknown, outside his native country of Romania, where he is held in similar regards as Shakespeare, or Pushkin, or in the English and Russian speaking world respectively, as someone who revolutionized the way Romanian is written, and a part of the canon of the classic writers. The beauty of his poems is usually lost in translation, which is why, like Pushkin, he cannot be appreciated fully in English. But the content of his poetry and philosophy can be perfectly understood in English, so we will take a look at one of his best works, The First Epistle. The First Epistle is part of a series of five poems, sometimes called satires by literary critic Titu Maiorescu, as they do consist of plenty of criticism at society. But due to their similarity in structure with the epistles of Horace, the name of epistles are letters stuck. The poem begins, with a call to meditation, by time slowing down, and by the rays of the moon, the archmistress of the sea. And it's such that the meditative self begin to wonder and think of the world and the human condition, from poor to kingly, from fools to geniuses. All the humankind is laid down, in these dichotomies, and this diversity of people are found to be ruled by two things, the moon's ray, and the specter of death. Among of the varieties of humans, we get stuck at one of them, an old professor, of fragile appearances, but who calculates and keeps thinking, and in his thinking like Atlas of old, the professor holds the entirety of the world, on a number. In stark contrast with his appearance, the unnamed professor is capable of comprehending the infinite universe. And so, we do see the old professor's mind think back to the beginning of time, when there was no being and no non-being, just nothing, an eternal peace, and from this nothing, one point begins moving, the first and only one, and by will alone, it start to unravel the nothingness, becoming something, and stars, worlds and moons begin to rise. And in this endless string of worlds we can found our own, in this big world we are but children of the little world. So we make on this earth of ours a multitude of ant hills, microscopic civilizations, kings, soldiers and scholars in succeeding generations, and we think ourselves as important. But the old professor's mind does not hold still, for his mind rapidly moves forward in time, to witness the end of all things, as the earth is cold, the sun's light extinguishes itself, and many worlds freeze and the stars die. Even time itself, steps down and dies, for what need is for time when nothing happens. And so, the eternal peace from the beginning is resumed yet again. And so, we see the futility of the human existence, of building a legacy, like in Byron's poem Ozymandias, where Ramses the second legacy is all but gone, but in Emanescu's poem we see this conclusion gone to universal proportion. And, this idea, does not go unnoticed by the old professor, but yet, he still tries to talk himself into believing that, his memory, his works will leave a legacy, an imprint on the world, when others will find refuge in his writings and thought. But he is highly criticized by the meditative self, the true narrator in our poem, for what other genius of the past is remembered in his fullness. He himself, the old professor doesn't know, all his life story, why others would remember it. Maybe others will try to fit him in some movements, some short entry, some little mention just so they would shine a little for their insight in discovering this old master and applause him by convention. While the true things of interest, would be, the little things, that he is human, made mistakes, and was flawed, just like them, not some better human being to be viewed as something much. And this is the satire, the cynical criticism of society of the piece by Emanescu, for in some way, while writing the five letters between 1880 and 1889, Emanescu did foresee his untimely dead in 1889, at the age of 39, due to many illnesses and a possible medical malpraxis. In some way, he was right, as even though today his memory is held in high regard, it did take some time for him to be recognized as such, due to his more conservative political stances, and even today, some find more interest in his more vulgar joke letters or his problems with alcohol. But in the end, Emanescu still got, through this poem, the last laugh from beyond the grave. This is all for today, if you have any thoughts on the matter, leave it in the comments below, maybe like and subscribe. 
Hope you enjoyed, and see you next time.